eighty percent of all people who need mental health help don't ask for it. So stigma is one of the things. A lot of parents right now feel better that they can label something and say, oh, well my child has oppositional defiance disorder instead of the child is a brat or... Um, <laughs> Welcome to the newest dialogue in politics, community news, human interest stories, entertainment, and information from Eastern North Carolina. Janet Connor Knox is an award-winning journalist with more than 25 years experience in print, radio, and television. This is Talking With Janet. back with Janelle Clevenger. She's the executive director for the Mental Health Association of Wilson. And thank you for joining me, Janelle. Thank you, Janet. Come talk with me, talk with me about the Mental Health Association. We've got East Point, and East Point kind of manages all of the folks who uh, do mental health work for people in the community. And then we've got the Mental Health Association. What do you guys do? What we do is, we've actually been around since 1959, which a lot of people don't know. We are a nonprofit group. We are a, one of the United Way's 14 agencies. And what we do is we kind of have three areas of specialty, I'll say. One is advocate for the mentally ill in, in Wilson County because a lot of times they are the voiceless. They are the forgotten, they're the voiceless, and so we keep tabs with what's going on in the legislature in North Carolina and in Washington and um, we get in touch with our, our senators and our representatives and let them know how we feel about what laws might be coming through and so we advocate. Another big thing we do is educate the community. We educate about mental illness and mental wellness. A lot of people don't think about the wellness point, but we do um, educate. We'll take our show to um, uh, things on the lawn, the library lawn the city might do, health fairs, everything we can get into like that. And the third thing we do is we do have some services that we have for the mentally ill in town. Um, but we don't, a lot of what I do is, um, years ago we had the Wilson Green Mental Health mm -hmm. Center. And everyone in Wilson knew there was a mental health problem, and there was also a psychiatric wing at the hospital. Everyone knew if they had a problem, that's where you went. That if you were in Wilson, you had a psychiatric problem, that's where you went. A few years ago, the state decided to combine counties, and first it became the Beacon Center, and that was four counties. Then it became East Point, which is what it is now, and it contains 12 counties, and so they're talking about expanding, expanding even it even larger more. than that. And I think by the time it's all over with, there may be two in the state, mm -hmm. which um, is very frustrating because the person taking care of you, of your case, might be four counties away, um, and there's little one-on-one. -on -one, um, but when you talk about the Mental Health Association of Wilson, is there one in all of the surrounding counties? Because this show... Is, is geared toward all of Eastern North Carolina. So do you have a counterpart in Pitt County, Edgecombe County, there, Halifax? Yeah, there is no longer one in Pitt County, but there is the Mental Health America Tar River Region is our counterpart in Rocky Mount, which is Nash County and Edgecombe County. And there is a very small MHA in Goldsboro, MHA in Wayne County. Um, a few years ago, the North Carolina Mental Health Association went belly up. And we did not get money from them, they did not get money from us, but they were a huge advocacy portion. Uh, they had lobbyists, um, and so that... Why did they go belly up? What happened? Um, the person who was in charge had not paid federal payroll taxes in like 10 oh, years. <laughs> that could do it. That could do it. So the government came in and took everything. <laughs> Was there not a need to replace it in something else then? No. Because I would like to think with the Great Recession and, and all of the other 
people that are needing help yeah that there might be a but well that's a that's another reason that they may have gone under because they decided at some point to provide services and so they okay. started working with Medicaid and and all that and I think they got further and further behind because Medicaid got further and further behind in paying oh. and so it you know you don't <clears throat> make a lot of money no. when you're working with Medicaid I can tell you that mm -hmm. and so that's one of the reasons they went under now some MHAs like there's an MHA in High Point they provide services mm -hmm. and I hear her talking a lot about um, almost having to give it up because it's almost not worth it because of the rate of repayment and the amount they get um, so they're struggling on with that but you your, your services are limited to what well for example one of the things we do like we have no therapists on staff for example I have a fairly large board of directors about 24 of them and we try to get a combination of people in the business therapists psychiatrists social workers we have some, um, we call them consumers, but that's not really a, I can't figure out the nice word, but everybody calls them. We don't call them patients because they're not our patients, not clients. So they are consumers. And so we have some consumers on our board. We have people on our board who had family members mm -hmm. that have um, mental illnesses. And we also have um, concerned citizens who want to be a part of it. So let's say, for instance, I know that a very, very good friend is having a problem. Do I tell them to call the Mental Health Association? They can call me. And I, that's where we were going with the, uh, the establishment yes. at East Point and everything. Uh -huh. People used to know where to go. So now people call me, and if they are in crisis, uh, you can do one of two things. You can either call... The police department call 911 uh, if someone is threatening to harm themselves or harm someone else that's a definite 911 call um, if it's a little more vague but st there's still danger call the East Point they have a 1-800 number that's staffed 24 7 East Point has contracts with three mobile crisis units. Wow, what's a mobile crisis unit? A mobile crisis unit is literally what you think it is somebody is we'll in their car will come there I had um, a uh, case where we called East Point for a mobile crisis unit to go to someone's house in Wilson. A, a man's 19-year-old son had come back from partying with some friends in Charlotte. And he thought he smoked something, got something in, something he smoked because his child came back a completely different person and was having wow. thoughts of harming. Um, Whoa. And also, interestingly enough, 19 years old is about the time when things like bipolar and schizophrenia show up. And it can take something like <clears throat> medication, a bad drug, or a traumatic uh, event to, for that to start happening. So, um, and with the United Way, we also work with other agencies. Like I called Nancy Salinger at the Crisis Center, and she followed up with this person. And so that person is on our radar now. Um, a lot of times, if it's not an emergency mm -hmm. and someone doesn't have the money for a therapist or they don't have insurance, that's when they do call East Point. East Point has a whole list of providers. They call them providers. And they know who accepts Medicaid, who doesn't, how to start the Medicaid process. They also have a limited amount of funds from the state for indigent care, people with no money to do that. There will probably be a lot of people in rural eastern North Carolina. Exactly. If they ask for help. If. If they ask for help. A lot of people don't. Well, Janelle, thank you for um, staying right here with us. We're going to be right back. challenge. Tiffany and Jasmine are here. Did you not see the dirty looks that they were giving you? Yeah, but they're still our friends, right? I need to tell you something. Your little girlfriend, her father's in prison. What? You get a date to the dance? Yeah, man. Obviously. Who do you think I am? I wrote your sister a note, and I asked her, does she like me? And what box did she check? Your friends. You know that, right? Yeah, friends. <laughs> Come on, Mickey, where are you? I'm coming.
coming. I'm coming. Hey, baby. No. What, what's wrong? I'm starting to think you don't understand what it means for me to be your man. Look, I just got you a gift. You don't listen. I already got this one. I told you to get something brand new. I'm sorry, Tom. Please, please. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Get in the car. We're back with Janelle Clevenger, who's the executive director for the Mental Health Association of Wilson. And before we went on break, we were talking about specifically about how um, there are so many people who are in need of help, and that your office can kind of help guide them. Is that? Yes, yes. Um, it's a sad statistic that I think about 80% of all people who need mental health help don't ask for it, don't get it. And part why, of the, Why don't they ask? Stigma. When I was growing up, there was no specific mental illness. You're just crazy. Right. And, and uh, you know, that's not what you say now. That is not what it is. No. It's maladaptive behavior. Maladaptive behavior. So I guess the question uh, comes in, is it, is it more acceptable, acceptable to have maladaptive behavior than to get help? Is the problem going to get the help? Is that what the issue is? It's a, it's a little of both. I think a lot of parents right now feel better that they can label something and say, oh, well, my child has oppositional defiance disorder instead of the child is a brat, or um, <laughs> my child yes. has ADHD or ADD, or maybe the child had Twizzlers and Mountain Dew for breakfast. You know, you don't, you don't know where that child is coming from. I do think that ADD is probably a little over diagnosed in the schools, but um, at the same time there's ADD could be the signal for something worse going on in that family, which is trauma. And that's something that we're working hard on to stop the, um, the cycle of trauma that can go from, from generation to generation. Um, when we talk about law enforcement's involved with people who are mentally ill. Um, how many law enforcement folk are actually knowledgeable of what to do if you run into someone with a mental illness? On the police force? Yes. Oh, well, anybody's law enforcement oh, agency. Um, a lot of, this is becoming a popular trend, thank goodness, but I know the Wilson Police Department and the Sheriff's Department and a lot of um, uh, law enforcement folks in the area send officers to CIT training, which is uh, crisis intervention training. And it's a full week, eight hours a day of um, you have people come and talk to you. I've done it before coming from the parent of a special needs child. My son is autistic. And so I would talk about what my child does and what they might run up against if they found my child who isn't nonverbal, but if, if excited or scared might not, you know, answer correctly, which has happened before. Um, and that becomes scarier if your child is a minority child. Yes. And is tall and, and is doing that very same thing, uh, depending on where they are, depending on what city they're in, they could end up dead. Well, and as is the case with uh, autism and some other disabilities, they don't look like anything's wrong with them. You know, there's no wheelchair, there's no facial. Nothing on the forehead. Nothing on the forehead, no mm -hmm. tag, no label. They yeah. are a child that is acting differently or having a tantrum or... And how would the police know that this kid is acting differently? Only They're training. walking down the street. How do you know that yeah. this kid is not an autistic kid and right. or is or... Or is talking to himself because he has... Um, is autistic and is echolalic, which is repeating things from a movie or a TV show or something. How do they know if it's schizophrenia, somebody talking to themselves, or someone with echolalia? So that's a fine line. But I will say they cover everything in CIT. And 
Um, I will also say that they screen their officers before they send them. They know that not everybody should be the one to respond to a call with somebody with mental illness. Um, so they pick the people carefully. And I will say that some people do not graduate, you know, oh. from the from the course. They can take it again, but they take it very seriously. Wow. And it's a great, uh, it's something that um, East Point does at, in with help from the police department. And they... I'm told we have to wrap up, but we have to talk about this support group. For unexpected death of a child. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, Wilson experienced a lot of, um, or several, death from overdose, substance abuse, and also some overdoses that weren't fatal, but they were still overdoses. But I was contacted by an organization that said, can you start a support group for the parents of these people who have lost children? They don't know where to go. They don't, if they go to Raleigh, they're exhausted. If they go to Raleigh, they don't like that group. We need something for them. So we decided it was actually a little too specific to do just death of substance abuse from overdose. So we, um, it basically, a lot of car accidents. Wow, lot, yeah. Um, a lot of young people have died in car accidents. We had our first murder victim mother uh, the other night, and um, it is traumatic to watch. If you're not going through it, it's traumatic. For me, I sit in another room and, and basically cry. But no one knows that kind of pain like another parent. I'm sure. And so that is the great thing about this group. And our facilitator, she comes from Wake Forest. She has her own support group company, grief company. And she lost her son about eight years ago. He had a substance abuse problem and he hung himself at her house. And so she's been going oh, through goodness. this. And so she is a great facilitator. And um, if somebody is uh, hogging the time, she can bring it in. If somebody goes into an inappropriate area, she can you know, bring people back to the center. What happens if you're a parent and your kid died five years ago? Oh, that's fine. Are they fine. still welcome to yes. go to this group? Yes, and in fact, they were saying that there were people going to this Raleigh group who had been going for eight years and had never moved forward, which is why we wanted to start a group where these people could heal. When is the group meeting and where can you get more information? Okay, uh, the group meets the fourth Monday of every month and they can call me at 243-2773 at the Mental Health Say Association. 243-2773, area code 252. No, thank you. You're very thank welcome. Thank you very much for talking with Janet. Thank you very much for watching. Please take advantage of all of these services. Uh, call the Mental Health Association. Don't be afraid. Thank you for talking to Janet. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on Talking with Janet, please contact us by email, brothersideent at gmail.com. Leave your name and contact information. Without that, your guest will not be considered. This has been a Brotherside Entertainment production.